Hi, everybody. This is Hondo Carpenter from Sports Illustrated's Fan Nation, Las Vegas Raiders Insider Podcast. We are thrilled to be joined today by my good friend, the great Matt Halatic from thespun.com. He's also my colleague, does a terrific job. All things sports. And Matt, this is the third week in a row I've had to start, but now I know all the information. Taylor Swift taking over the NFL. I know now Swifties are what they call her fans. This is nuts. I'm sorry, when Adam Schefter, and we're going to get all Raiders, just I have to get this out of the way. When Adam Schefter is tweeting information about Taylor Swift, this is ridiculous. I get it. She's famous. But come on now. Am, am I just being the old man? Get off my lawn. No, I think it's definitely jumped the shark a little bit uh, in terms of the constant coverage. And like you said, insiders like Adam Schefter and others tweeting about it and filming her arrival at MetLife the other night. But then when the ratings come out on, on Monday afternoon and you see that NBC said it had its highest rated uh, viewing since the Super Bowl and it increased exponentially its viewership in certain categories with young women and with teenage girls, you understand why, because the NFL is in the money making business and Taylor Swift is now in the process of making them a lot more money than they even had before. <laughs> now I heard this. Now, let me just say this. I have always been a Twitter guy. And then, so I'm not really into the instant grams and all that kind of stuff, <clears throat> but I got an instant gram the other day, just so I could follow Chandler Jones. So I don't do anything on, I don't even know how I post a couple pictures of my kids. Cause I've asked people, how do they do it? And they did it but I don't even know how to do it. But I'm told she has more Instagrams. Now, I don't know if that's bigger. I don't think that's bigger than Twitter. Following than the NFL and all the NFL teams combined. I get it. If it's going to do good for the league, I'm for it. I'm just like, man, come on. And then I learned from my 18-year-old son that she's going to break up with me, which you know Duffy well. Dad, she's going to break up with him and then write a whole album. <laughs> That's probably the most no, likely outcome at some point, yes. And then God. she'll make right. a lot more money off of it then. So it's a lot of money changing hands. Wow. All right. So let's now get to what matters. <clears throat> the Raiders were terrible on Sunday. The coaching was horrible. Listen, I'm not letting players off the hook either. There, the, but but that's at this point in the season when you continually see the same people making the same mistakes or you see your veterans making the mistakes that that falls on coaching. You know, personally, cause we're friends personally. I got a lot of respect for Josh McDaniels, the man. I like him a lot. I like Dave Ziegler a lot. I think they're good people. I think they're you know, great husbands, great fathers, great friends. We know that Josh is a great offensive coordinator, but at this point, Josh now has to prove, I mean, he's, he is 21 games into his regime. And I asked him after the game, I said, Josh, you're 21 games into your regime and your team statistically is worse than the one you inherited that was an NFL playoff team. How do you and your staff fix it? It wasn't a personal attack. It was a factual attack. It wasn't even an attack. It was just a factual question. Am I being too hard on Josh McDaniels or am I 100% correct? This is all coaching. It isn't year one where you're still waiting to get your guys, your thoughts. No, it's a result business. And listen, you know, teams don't want to continuously have upheaval at the coaching and, and general manager spots, especially the Raiders are coming off the, that tumultuous situation with John Gruden. They obviously are looking for some stability with Josh McDaniels and Dave Ziegler, but it's a results-based league. And the fact is they were a playoff team in 2021. They slipped six wins last year, and now they're up to a one and three start this year. And if things don't turn around, I, you, I can't tell you if Josh Daniels would lose his job after this year. Only you or any insiders could say that. Um, and I don't even know if it would be determined at this point. But even if he didn't, didn't keep his job, and even if he didn't lose his job, he kept it for 2025, 2024, the hot seat, the pressure would be immense at that point because you would be coming off back-to-back -back losing seasons, uh, year three, you really need to show some progress by that point. So this is a, a crossroads for them. There's no doubt about it. It's crossroads, crossroads for them. 
Um, they have a couple pieces, you know, in place. They have, I mean, I will say this, Aiden O'Connell, I thought, did pretty well, all things considered, for his first start. Yeah, too. Took a little bit of a beating, but he kept playing. He kept fighting. He had him in position to tie the game. I don't think that pick was necessarily – interception was necessarily all on him. I think it was kind of a weird play call, and it didn't really get executed well. So, uh, you know, but I think he did a fine job for, a, you know, a mid-round pick coming into his first start. Um, but it's time well, to I talked about – I talked about this in my podcast yesterday, but I was told, because I wrote about this, this is on the record. This is what I love about what we do in the digital age. People can go back and watch videos or go back and read what we wrote to substantiate what we say. But I was asked, you know, prior to training camp, what happens if, if, uh, you know, Jimmy gets injured, who would be the quarterback? I said, it depends on what time of the year that it was at. So I was told that, you know, Brian was going to be the backup. This was a coming out of training camp. And that when they thought Aiden was ready, they would move him up to the second string where people were where he was getting more reps. And because here's the problem, and you know this, but most fans don't because they're not at practice. You only got, you know, basically 70 guys. And so when you're running reps, your first string quarterback gets at every, your first string guy at every position gets by far the most reps. Your second string guy gets some, and your third string guy gets little or no reps. I mean, it's hard to, to do anything because you just don't get a lot of reps because practices are smaller, rosters are smaller. And so I said this in my podcast after the game, I reiterated it yesterday to play. Aiden O'Connell, when the week before he's not even active and he's your third stringer, to me, you have not done anything to prepare the kid for the moment. Bam. Okay, here we go. You're the guy. And I, I don't think I don't think starting Aiden was the wrong thing. But I think when you put a kid in that position and he's unprepared, I thought Aiden did as well as you could expect. Hey. He didn't do he he did what Jimmy does in his first start, making a lot less money. No, I agree. I think that you got the most out of him that you could expect in that situation. And I think that what it showed, the willingness to go to him there when you're one and two in really sort of a must-win game for week four of a regular season, shows that the Raiders believe that there's something there with him for the future, number one. And number two, I think that they, you know, it, it shows that they could turn it over to him, I think, sooner rather than later if this season slips away or if Jimmy Garoppolo gets banged up again. Because, listen, the Raiders didn't make an investment in Jimmy Garoppolo. He was Josh McDaniel's hand-picked quarterback that he wanted after, you know, they parted ways with, with Derek Carr. But Jimmy is still only a temporary. Oh, well, hold on, guy. hold on, because hold on, because you know I'm going to always be fair. Tom Brady was that guy, right? Right. So when he you... wasn't the hand picked. He was the okay. Who's left over pick? Okay, yeah. So he was the second second option when Brady made it clear that he was retired and wasn't going to come to Vegas. Um, but I think that you look at it. I think that the Raiders know that Garoppolo is not their long term franchise guy. You see, there's you know. Early 30s, he's had injury issues. I think that he's sort of a bridge QB at this point. And the bridge may be built sooner than you think if they struggle this year and they want to get a look at Aiden O'Connell. Because here's the thing. If they if they lose, you know, if they're in a position where later in the year they're in a losing season and it looks like they might be in position to draft one of the quarterbacks this year. Um, I don't know if It'll be Caleb Williams because he got the number one pick to get him. But there's a few other first round mock guys at this point. Uh, Drake May, obviously, JJ McCarthy. I've seen Quinn Ewers if he comes out, Shador Sanders, Michael Penix Jr. The list goes on and on. They need to know okay, are we going to try to make a move for one of these guys if we want a quarterback, or can we work with Aiden O'Connell in 2024 and beyond? Here's the problem, and I want to run this by you. I want to get your opinion. Is And I said this right after the game, and I maintain it. If Jimmy's healthy, he's their guy because they know they got to win. 
So if they get to a place where they know the season's over, then do they give Aiden Connell, O'Connell more reps? But the problem is if you do, you still got Jimmy. You're married to Jimmy next year salary cap-wise. You're married to him. So whether you want to go pick another quarterback or whatever, if you go away from Jimmy, then do you almost make it where, okay, we, we went away from Jimmy. We got to go pay another quarterback not to be here. There is a lot of things up in the air to me, and I, I, I think this is amazing. And you probably saw I did it on Twitter, a poll where thousands of Raider Nation voted and said, you know, I think it was 76%. Mm -hmm. We want Aiden O'Connell. Fine, we're done with Jimmy. Let's go. Let's move on. Which I understand the fan part, but if you're Josh McDaniels and Dave Ziegler and you need you need wins and you think Jimmy gives it, you got to go get play Jimmy. You just got a you just got a a hot brew of trouble. All right, I want to ask you a couple other questions, and I I think they're germane and fair. As I'm talking to people around the NFL, I'm hearing a lot of people. I mean, people really, really, really like Caleb Williams, so I'm not diminishing Caleb, but I'm hearing from a ton of people now. The people I like to listen to, Matt are the ones who have been in the league a long time because there's some sustainability. They draft well, et cetera, et cetera. I'll tell you who when we get off air. But one NFL general manager uh, told me, and I want to read this to you, in all of our scouting, and certainly there's a ways to go, it's not even close. Drake May is the number one project, a prospect at quarterback. I've heard several people say that, and I'll tell you who that is when we go off air. Um, say that that's brewing. I think that's going to be a lot of fun because I think there are a lot of teams that are traditionally at the bottom that maybe will say, okay, we'll go for Caleb. He's the bright, shiny thing. And it very well could be just like people went thought Ryan Leaf was going to be better than Peyton Manning. I'm not calling Caleb Williams Ryan Leaf. I'm just saying I think that this is brewing looking ahead to the draft already. What are you hearing? Things always change as we get into draft season. Um, and you look at some recent years, I mean, going into draft season in 2018, after the 2017 season, 2018 winter, I don't think anybody thought that Baker Mayfield was going to end up being the number one pick in that draft. Everyone yep. said he was going to be a first rounder. They knew he'd go early. But I think people thought that it would be, you know, Sam Darnold maybe going number one, if anybody, uh, as a quarterback. You know, there's been instances where guys have skyrocketed. Look at Anthony Richardson, who was the third quarterback taken last year, but he faulted all the way up to the number four overall pick with his performance and then with what he did in the combines. So there's so much time left. Um, and what fascinates me is that you're going to see the teams that, were, that, are, that are looking already like, okay, they're going to need a quarterback. All right, you know, let, let Say the, the Bears have the Bears are own four and the Panthers are own four. So they're two worst teams record wise. The Bears have the Panthers pick, so the Bears are in a great spot to get a quarterback, assuming they move on from from Justin Fields, either with their own pick or with Carolinas. But then after that, you have, you know, do the Raiders, if they falter enough, do they look for another look for a quarterback? What about the Patriots? What about the Vikings? If they say, hey, we're done, you know, we got to move on from Kirk Cousins. We got to go with a cheaper option, younger option. Um, what about the Falcons if things slip and they say, listen, we can't stick with the, uh, um, Desmond Ritter? What about the Giants who just paid Daniel Jones big money, but it's a two-year deal essentially they can get out of after two years. So do they say, listen, we're going to bite the bullet in 2024 and pay him to either start the season as a starter or be the backup? And we're going to cut ties for whatever dead money after that. And go to our, our young guy uh, if they go things go south enough. Um, you know uh, the Jets if they keep losing, I think they're they're going to have Rodgers back next year. So I wouldn't put them in this group. But there's a lot of teams that are could be looking for quarterbacks that maybe people didn't think would be looking for quarterbacks going into this year. So it should be very fun to see how it, it plays out. Yeah, I totally agree with you, hundred <clears throat> percent. And uh. No, no argument. All right, I want to get back on the Raiders for a minute because I think it's it's very fascinating to me. When you look at their organization, 
I think Josh McDaniels has been let down by some of his coaching staff. I'm not saying he has a bad one. I think overall it's a very good staff, but I think he's got a couple of bad apples on there that he, that, that he needs to deal with. It's his staff. And when you look at this team, the lack of discipline, the continuing to make execution. And, and here's the thing. I'm all right with rookies. I'm all right with a rook making a mistake. I'm all right with a rook learning the game. I, I, I don't have any. And if people that follow me know I'm that way, I've been that way all along because there's a learning curve. But you get to year three in this league. Or you're a veteran that's been bought in and paid big money. You're their guy and you're doing it. I'm sorry, that's a reflection of the leadership then. Because if you're if you're not coach, if you're allowing it, you're coaching it. I agree. And you know, I think another thing too, as the season goes on, you're through four weeks now, you're basically at the quarter pole of the season. Um tolerance for operational issues and execution issues becomes even less for for should be for coaches and for fans too because this isn't week one where you're coming with you know maybe you guys didn't play a lot in the preseason it's their first real game reps things like that you should be starting to hum a little bit now and it should be running smoother and if you're still having the same issues that reflects poorly on on everybody but again like you said if one guy is struggling you know, whether it's rookie or whatever, it, it, a lot of times it's a, it could be a player issue. But if a unit is struggling or multiple people or whatever, then you got to look at coaching and, and look at the leadership issue because why isn't this getting through? Why isn't this, you know, being taught? Or if it is being taught, why isn't it being absorbed and then implemented out on the field? You know, uh, Patrick Graham, the defensive coordinator, takes a ton of heat. And, but I, I want to be, as fair as I can, because I'm not a fan, is you have a team that put $102 million of the salary cap into the offense. And I'm sorry, I think, oh, I, I say I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm going to get that out of my vocabulary. Um, I think the defense has played, considering the amount of money they spend on it, the youth and other areas, I think has played relatively well. It's the Raiders offense that's costing them. It's the it's the stupid penalties that kill drives early. It's the turnovers this week. I mean, it, it's getting to the point now where you put all of that money. I used the term the other night. It's like buying a brand new Lamborghini, but forgetting you need a transmission. You spend all that money on that offense and they can't go out and score. Yeah, I think they're averaging... It's like 15 or 16 points a game now. It's 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 ridiculous. It's inexcusable. And and I understand that you, people like to pick the low hanging fruit. You've invested so much money in your offense, they're not getting the job done. I'm sorry. Can do I think the defense can play better? Yes. Do I think there are missed tackles? Yes. Do I think there are some execution? Yes. But you put all of your money. Not all, but you put a vast amount of your money in that offense. And so you're getting out of your defense what you have a right to expect. The problem is you're not getting out of your offense what you have a right to expect. To me, that's all on Josh. I agree. I think, listen, the Raiders, I think, are one of only two teams. I think it's them and the Giants that don't have a take takeaway yet this year, which is hard to believe defensively through four games. So that that is a problem. And again, I do think that the Raiders, they need – We've talked about they need an influx of talent on the defensive side of the ball. Um, they need to see if some guys can develop on that side that they, they've used either high draft picks on or, or brought in free agency. But I do think that, you, listen, when you are – when you employ one of the best running backs in the NFL, one of the best, if not the best wide receivers in the NFL – when you have one of the better left tackles in the NFL and, you know, you bring in a veteran quarterback, you bring in another number two wide receiver uh, who has experience. You have a slot guy that you extended your own guy, Hunter Renfro. Um, you use a second round pick on the best, probably the best tight end um, or the shortest thing at tight end coming out of that class 
in Michael Mayer. The fans have a right to expect more there and expect more production. And again, listen, they had a rookie playing in his first game last weekend. I think he did probably as well as you could have hoped. But they didn't have a rookie playing against Buffalo, who, as good as Buffalo is, the Raiders didn't score after the first drive of the game. Other than if they scored a touchdown after the first drive of the game. Mm -hmm. um, Pittsburgh, they scored early in the first quarter, didn't score again until midway late through the fourth. So when you're getting those offensive lulls, whether it's through you can't sustain drives or the Pittsburgh game, Garoppolo has some silly turnovers, uh, it's a problem. And I think that it's an offensive league. It, it, first and foremost, it's an offensive league. You can't have a, you know, a sieve on defense. Uh, right. You need playmakers. You need to be able to play defense, but you need to be able to score points in this league now to, to do anything. Well, and just so you know, the Raiders do have a turnover. They got an interception from Trayvon Morig. I'm sorry. You're right. They do. So I think it's, it's either the Giants are the only team or there's one other team besides them. My fault. I forgot they did intercept but Herbert still, on Sunday. But still, yeah. for a team that put all emphasis in training camp on turnovers and big yeah. plays, it, 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 it it's germane. Um, anyways, so let's talk about this. I've put it all on coaching and I think that's fair. I'm not against putting it on players. Now I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking for Monday night. And I want to get your opinion. I don't want to hear about Aiden or Jimmy. I know what I would do. Doesn't matter what I would do. I don't want to hear about defense. I don't want to hear about this guy is not tackling. This guy's not catching. Where's Hunter Renfro? We're going to get into all that because those are all things that, that we discuss. But when I'm talking about the game, this is a Green Bay Packer team. The Raiders should beat at home. This is a team that all the pressure in the world to me rests squarely on the shoulders of Josh McDaniels. This whole game is about him. If I'm, if I'm um, the production team doing Monday Night Football, I have a camera that never leaves Josh McDaniels because this is who the game is about. I mean, he is squarely under the microscope. <clears throat> He's got to right the ship. He's got to get the team back in order. He's got to get his coaches coaching better, his players playing better. These are his guys. The money's been spent the way he wants. To me, this entire week, the storyline, you know, last week it was can Herbert – you know, punish Herbert, physically go after Herbert, attack it. No, 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 none of that. None of it. Don't want to hear it. <clears throat> and we'll discuss it. I don't want to hear it from them. It's all about Josh. You got to prove 22 games into your career as a Raider. 22 games. You are 7 and 14. You have got to prove at home against a beatable team like Pittsburgh was. You you got to get the you got to get the, the ship back on track. This is all about him, adjustments, his staff, everything else. To me, am I oversimplifying it? I don't think I am. This next, and I know we're talking immediately Monday night with the Packers. This next six game stretch is absolutely paramount for Josh McDaniels and his regime because if you look at it. They have one game that they should lose on the road in Detroit because the Lions are actually a functional, solid NFL team. But the other five games are – they have four home games against the Packers, who have struggled, the Patriots, who have struggled offensively. You know Bill Belichick is going to be motivated facing his old assistant. You know he's going to have a strong defense, but their offense has not been good. They have two back-to-back -back home games against the two New York teams – who have been or the only two teams in the league that haven't played a snap with an played an offensive snap with a lead this season. They're both one and three. They're both bad. Those are and their their other away game in that stretch is at the Bears, who are bad. So those are five winnable games out of six. Four of them are at home. And I know you can talk about the lack of home field advantage. That's a topic for a whole, a whole other topic for a po different podcast. The Raiders don't go three and three in these next six games at least. It could get up because after that, you got the Dolphins, you got the Chiefs, you have the Chargers again, you have the Chiefs again. You know, if you're if you're three and three in this six game stretch and you're four and six, well, or maybe you can pull a couple wins off down the stretch. You finish even four if you finish and seven. And, what? You, you well, say I'm saying if you 
if you're four and six overall, if you go three and three. Oh, okay, 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 yep. yeah. Four okay. and two is even better. I mean, you're five and five. Then you could say, all right, we can maybe hang in the playoff race uh, later in the season. But they have to be at least three and three in this this stretch coming up. Uh, if they're not, it's it's going to look really poorly. and Things could spiral. Right, and I want to add this because this is something that 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 I think. I I thought with the talent they had, the defense they had, and everything else, this was a nine win team. And I'm getting a lot of people. Hey, are you gonna are you gonna go back on that? No, because this is a nine win team. If they don't get to nine, they woefully underreach underachieve. Nine is what with this talent, with this staff, this is where they should be is nine wins. To me, that is the standard. And I said if Jimmy stays healthy for all seventeen, well, he hasn't. He hasn't. And the point of the matter is, is that you want to get mad at Jimmy, the staff signed a guy that they knew was habitually injured. And you and I talked about this in the offseason. I said, you got to give Jimmy, you mean you got to give Josh and Dave the benefit of the doubt. This is the guy they want. They think that they can keep him healthy. Great. <clears throat> Great. But the moment he gets injured and starts missing, it's on them. I'm, I'm I'm just saying there are a lot of dynamics in this water. This game is all about Josh, and these next six games are mammoth. They are, and again, in year two, you're supposed to start to put your stamp on things, and it's supposed to really become your team. Obviously, not every player is his. He's inherited some some of the roster, some really good pieces, some not so great pieces, but. He's molded it enough where this is starting, should be starting to take on the identity of his team. Um, and you need to see improvement from year one to year two and get ready to make another leap in year three. So if they can't get out of this six game stretch, I think three and three, four and two, it's going to be, it, it could get ugly. They're, they might struggle at that point to even get to the six wins they had in 2022. So we'll see. I'm, I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you right now. This game is the beginning of a six-game stretch that's all about Josh McDaniels. We're going to learn everything we need to know about Josh McDaniels these next six weeks. All right, I want to ask you a question. Brian Dayball goes off on Daniel Jones on the sideline. What did you think of that as a G-man, as a fan of the G-man? Well, I mean, the game was an abomination. I thought it was very interesting, though, because this isn't the first time we've seen Dayball kind of share his – displeasure with Daniel Jones during a game. It happened, actually happened in the first regular season game together last year. Um, and he threw a bad interception in the second half against the Titans. They ended up coming back and winning. Uh, but he had that kind of moment on the sideline right then. It's fascinating because to me, the Giants, when J Joe Shane, the GM, and Dable, the head coach, came in in 2022, they made the right decision to decline Daniel Jones' fifth-year option for 2023. And I think they were going to say, He's here for 2022. We'll play it out. Probably won't be very good. We'll be in a position to take our next quarterback. Well, they ended up being better than people thought. They won nine games. They won a playoff game. And now that kind of changes things. And here's the question. How much of bringing, keeping Daniel Jones for four years, 160 million, I think it's really two years, 82 guaranteed before they can get out of it. Um, how much of that was Joe Shane and Gable believing in him and thinking, okay, well, we were able to make this work last year. We can make it work even better with some better pieces there. How much of that was ownership who loves Jones and was there when they was, was drafted wanting him. If things go south and the Giants win three or four games or something like that, um, I don't think they're going to want to move after, on from another head coach after two seasons. They've done it three times in a row. So Dable, I think, is safe. But does he want his own quarterback, even though they can't cut Daniel Jones after this season? They have to hold on to him at least to 2024 cap wise. Um, after that, I think they release him after 2024. There's thirty three million dollars of dead money spread over 2025 and 2026. So two years, thirty three million dollars dead money. But listen, the Eagles ate thirty four million dollars of dead money in one season to get rid of Carson Wentz. If you're. Don't believe in your quarterback and you have a better option, you suck it up and you do it. So that's why I think it's really fascinating to see what's going to happen if the Giants continue to look as, as bad as they have and they're in position to take 
one of the premier quarterbacks this year. Um, do they do they do that? Do they say we'll run it back one more year with Daniel? And if it doesn't improve, well, we'll just cut ties then and we'll get a quarterback in 2025. Uh, a lot of things to think about. All right. Prediction time. The Raiders. Monday night football. Hosting the pack. What's your prediction? You know, it's tough because coming into this game, I had them I had them at seven and ten in the season. Coming into this game, though, I had them at two and two. I think it's a winnable game. I talked about this. I thought that the Packers, they blew the game uh, against Atlanta and then really got lucky that Derek Carr got hurt when they were down 17-0 to the Saints because the Saints couldn't do anything after that. They ended up coming back and winning. And, the, like, again, the Lions are actually a good team, but the Lions embarrassed the Packers at Lambeau last week. Um, so I, this is a winnable game. The problem is this. Garoppolo come up with concussion. The way they played so poorly the last couple of weeks, I can't pick the Raiders to win right now until I see them do it again. So I'm going with Green Bay in an ugly one. I have 24-20 Green Bay on Monday night. I think it's going to be a – I think no matter who wins, it's going to be a knockdown, dragout type game. But I think that I have to see the Raiders play a complete game and win again before I can pick them to win another game. And you have them scoring more points than they've scored all year, finally getting into the 20 category. It's going to listen. Uh, it's yeah, a big week. Still... These next six these next six weeks are all about Josh McDaniels. It's all about him. He's going to show us who he is. And 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 uh, not, not who he is as a man and his character, just as right. a coach. We're going to learn these next six weeks are big. I'm Hondo Carpenter from Sports Illustrated's Fan Nation. He is the one and only, the great Matt Halatic from the Spun.com. You should put him in your favorites. Just trust me, you won't regret it. Part of the Fans First Sports Network. Thanks for watching today, everybody. God bless you. Have a good day.